Hello everyone. I'm not sure if everyone is here. I'm checking to see if I can get access for you all to comment this time. It didn't work last time, so I apologize for that. However, there it is. What I am going to do is wait a minute. As you can see, I'm wearing a t-shirt today, no collar. Uh, people like me <laughs> always have our fingers in multiple causes. So I'm wearing a t-shirt for Don't Bully Us Pitbull Rescue, which is located in South Jersey. And they help rescue lots of dogs that are in bad shape from Philadelphia and the surrounding area. Uh, Pitbulls are really good dogs if they're trained and brought up right, pretty much like any other dog. And, but they have this weird reputation and people illegally breed them and buy them and sell them and it's just a terrible thing. So adopt a dog. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say about dogs for now. But pretty much every week I'll wear a t-shirt of a different rescue organization or a shelter because you should adopt your animals rather than buy them from stores because there are rabbits and snakes and dogs and cats and all that available. So adopt. In fact, I've got a cat in my lap right now. She doesn't want to leave. So, welcome to our second Educating for Change seminar. Uh, as you can see, my hair's a little wet. I took a shower. I'm still a little uh, shaggy. Haven't had a haircut in five or six months, so you'll have to bear with me. But I wanted to talk today about children's activism. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to tell you a story, and after it's over, in the comment section, uh, I'll, I'll share photographs and some links for more information like I did last week. Uh, I, I know now that I can share pictures and things and share my screen during these lives, but I didn't have it set up because all my notes are over on this side, on my other computer so that I could keep track because I have a lot to say today. So, I didn't say what it was in the introduction, but I'll say it now. I'm going to talk about The Little Rock Nine. It's one of those great stories, and it sheds light on the power that children have to push change in this world and to be agents of change. And since many uh, of you here are watching with your children or for your children, I want you to know those stories and understand the empowerment and joy that comes from knowing the stories. So let's background it a little bit. Um, first, I will do what I did last week. I'll do it again in case there's any first timers. Tell you about me because, of course, you should never just take information simply because it's presented to you, but consider the source, consider the evidence, consider the credibility. So, my name's Joseph Soler. I am an adjunct professor of history at Rowan College of Burlington County, and I also adjunct teach at Alvernia University. I received my undergraduate degree in history and African American studies, or African American history pretty much, from Harvard University, and then my master's and PhD from Temple University in urban education. And so I've spent most of my life studying educational systems, educational policy, and the influence of factors on teaching and learning, such as race, gender, etc. So this is a, a big area of interest for me. And African American history has been a passion for me, even though, as you can see, I'm not actually African American, although DNA tests show that I am 10% or 12% West African. Uh, so there's a little bit, but I didn't, I certainly didn't grow up that way. So this is my interest. This is my passion. I have a, a broad knowledge base. I'm constantly adding and learning. So education. Go back to the beginning. Uh, public schools take a long time to develop. Uh, they develop most significantly in New England in the 1840s and 50s, and they develop pretty much nowhere in the southern states where slavery holds reign. And in fact, in terms of African Americans, they were 
in the context of slavery, banned from any education whatsoever. And by any education, I mean that literally it could be a capital offense. Uh, an enslaved person could be executed if he or she was teaching other enslaved people how to read. So there was a strong and violent hostility towards basic literacy and learning for enslaved people. This didn't happen right away. This happened in the 1800s as slavery becomes more entrenched and other issues, which I'll cover in later, uh, later discussions related to scientific racism and, and the culture caricatures like Jim Crow and Aunt Jemima that I talked about last week. So after the Civil War is over and slavery is over, we see volunteers and the government create an entire educational system in the South for the first time in Southern history. As you can imagine, these systems were segregated. They weren't automatically segregated. The first volunteer teachers that went down South found that they had black and white students, but as it became more systematic, it became clear that teachers who attempted to educate in mixed settings could be subject to violence from white supremacist groups like the Ku Klux Klan, the Knights of the White Camellia, the White Liners, the White League, the etc. There was dozens of these organizations. And so they began developing a segregated school system as a consequence of the white supremacist violence in the South. This gets codified in the Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court decision in 1896, which declared that in all public facilities, uh, separate but equal is allowed, meaning you can have a completely separate black and white world as long as conditions are equal. Not surprisingly, uh, from that point onward, the segregated black schools in the South were systematically underfunded vis-a-vis -vis their white counterparts, and so you had thousands and thousands of black taxpayers going to underfunded schools without resources, supplies, books, sometimes even heating, uh, while white schools enjoyed all that they possibly could. By the 1950s, we're beginning to see cracks in the veneer of segregation. We're beginning to see a new spirit of activism. President Harry Truman desegregates the armed forces in 48 through an executive order as commander in chief and the NAACP begins launching its long strategy. This leads to the very famous, excuse me, keep shifting because my foot hurts, sorry. The very famous Brown versus the Board of Education decision. Now, little tidbits and caveats about that. Brown versus Board of Education is the name of it. It's Brown versus Board of Education et al. It was actually a grouping of multiple cases from multiple plaintiffs. And traditionally, when they group multiple cases together that have a shared question, they will name the case based upon alphabetical order of the plaintiffs. And so this case was a grouping of cases from Kansas, South Carolina, Virginia, Delaware, and Washington, DC. Now, if they had followed their traditional precedent, this case, should go down in history as Briggs versus South Carolina. The reason why it did not is because the Supreme Court was afraid that naming the case after South Carolina would lead to so much violence it would undercut. So it becomes Brown. They hand down their ruling and I'm going to read you a whole paragraph, I'm sorry. But this is really important because there's some loopholes in here that explain later issues. The Supreme Court says, in part, in ruling that separate is inherently unequal. Today, education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments, compulsory school attendance laws, and the great expenditures for education both demonstrate our recognition of the importance of education to our democratic society. It is required in the performance of our most basic public responsibilities, even service in the armed forces. It is the very foundation of good citizenship. 
Today, it is a principal instrument in awakening the child to cultural values, in preparing him for later professional training, and in helping him to adjust normally to his environment. In these days, it is doubtful that any child may reasonably expect it to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education. This is the key phrase coming up. Such an opportunity where the state has undertaken to provide it is a right which must be made available to all on equal terms. So the Supreme Court says that separate is inherently unequal later on, but they did not provide any remedy. And in fact, one of the secrets is that it takes an entire year before finally the plaintiffs in the Brown case sue again and say nothing is being done. And so Brown too is handed down in 1955. And what they say in 1955 is that the states who have practiced legal segregation must begin implementing plans of integration in support of their May 17, 1954 opinion, and that they are remanding the cases down to the lower courts. In other words, it was now up to lower courts to supervise integration plans. And again, very little happens. So we finally get to Little Rock, Arkansas, 1956. And the NAACP decides that this would be a good place to test their case. And here you see shenanigans at work almost immediately. The recently reelected governor of Arkansas, Orville Faubus, has won re-election by moving to the right on issues of desegregation. He actually was considered not that bad a governor by the black community in Arkansas, but he was a, faced with a primary challenge from a diehard segregationist, and so he becomes much more of a diehard segregationist. What they did in Little Rock when faced with the possibility of having to integrate is whereas there had been the central high school, they immediately began building two new high schools. One on the west side of town, which was the white part of town, and one on the east side of town, which was the black part of town. Or basically what the southern strategy would be from this point forward when they weren't just straight up fighting it is what they call neighborhood schools. So if you build this, the high school in a white neighborhood and you build a high school in a black neighborhood, they're not specifically requiring that black and white students can't go to school together. They're just saying, well, they only go to school in their neighborhood. And so, you know, it's not our fault that the high school's in a white neighborhood and there's another high school in a black neighborhood, except that it is their fault because that was the plan. Central High School still stands and the field secretary organizer in Little Rock, Daisy Bates, begins trying to recruit students to try to enroll in the high school. So over 100 African-American parents try to enroll their kids in Little Rock. The school chooses 39 that they think are acceptable according to the superintendent. And by the time the first day of school arrived, that number, that number had been whittled down to nine. What's interesting about this as well is that whereas Little Rock Central High School was not integrated, there is some evidence. I don't have this confirmed, and I was hunting and hunting for this, but there is some evidence, and I've read it before but not commented on a lot, that the elementary schools in Little Rock, Arkansas might actually have been integrated. And so really the issue and the fear had to do with the high schools. And the reason why that matters is because of this. There was an organization called the Women's Council, or excuse me, the Motherhood Council, Mother's League, sorry, Mother's League, that fought this. And what they argued about why the high school shouldn't be integrated was because of the black boys. 
And so their strategy was an attack on black boys and how black boys were dangerous and black boys might come after their little delicate white girls um, and be aggressive and, and whatnot, make them uncomfortable. And so we see this racial dynamic, but we also see this something that's also very common in today's society, this notion of black boyhood being somehow dangerous or unruly or unsettled, an attack on black boyhood, which to this day endangers the lives of black boys as we've witnessed all too often in our contemporary moment. So when they choose nine, they end up with six girls and three boys. And I'm going to name them because the most important thing is that we name these children these were children who volunteered to take a giant step forward in the civil rights of U.S. history in 1957. So, the oldest and the only senior was Ernest Green. And he was 16, going on 17 during that school year. There was Elizabeth Eckford. She was... 15 years old. There was Jefferson Thomas, who was 14 when this beginning of the school year and would turn 15 before he had a chance to set foot in the high school. There was Terrence Roberts, who was 16 years old, going on 17. The youngest was Carlotta Walls, who was 14 years old. Minnie Jean Brown, who was 15 or 16, I didn't get her date. There was Gloria Ray, who was 14, and she would turn 15 during those first, during September as well. And interesting side note about Gloria Ray, when word got out that Gloria Ray's mother was enrolling her in Little Rock, Gloria Ray's mother was fired from her job because she was trying to enroll her daughter in Little Rock Central High School. Then there was Thelma Mothershead, who was turning 17 that year, and Melba Patillo, who was 16 years old. So these are the nine. And it's worth noting that at the beginning of the school year, not a single one of them was over the age of 16 yet. Green would turn 16 towards the end of September, or 17 rather. But these are children. These are children. These are teenagers, nine of whom are on the front. I don't call it the front lines. I, I, I'm tired of always using military rhetoric for all of these things. But they were taking the first steps forward in American history for integration of schools in the South. And we must consider where we were as 16 year olds ourselves, the immense courage that this took for those children. But of course the South would not go down. And once plans were announced for these children to enroll, a document was issued in Congress called the Southern Manifesto. And every single representative and senator from Arkansas signed this so-called Southern Manifesto. And the Southern Manifesto was also full of very, if you, if you listen closely today, very familiar arguments. And one is they declare that the courts are abusing their judicial power and that the judiciary is undertaking to legislate over and encroach on the rights of the states and the people. So in other words, what they denounced today is judicial activism is in here saying that it was illegal for the Supreme Court to say it. They also have another argument. The original Constitution doesn't mention education and the 14th Amendment doesn't mention education. So there's no reason why, should it, why it should apply. This is a so-called originalist argument because the Constitution doesn't mention it there's no responsibility to it. There's no federal role in it whatsoever. So the Supreme Court has no right to order desegregation. So they all issue this Southern Manifesto and they say they will take any legal means necessary 
to oppose the integration of schools. Any means necessary. Legal. We made sure to say legal. Legal means necessary. So on September 2nd, 1957, things are getting hot. This white supremacist Mother's League or Mother's Council has held a meeting denouncing that black boys will be in school with their white daughters and saying planning to protest. Governor Arville Falbus, governor of Arkansas, calls up the Arkansas National Guard because he wants to prevent what he says, blood in the streets, because, as he says, he heard white supremacists were coming to make trouble. And um, they were. They were just the citizenry of Little Rock. So that day, Daisy Bates, the coordinator, NAACP organizer, uh, sends a message out that all the kids are supposed to come to her house and they will all go to school together. Uh, one student, Elizabeth Eckford, did not receive the message because Elizabeth Eckford's family didn't own a telephone. So on September 4th, 1957, Elizabeth Eckford walks alone to Little Rock High School while the other eight are at Daisy Bates's house. The sight that greets her when she approaches the high school is 1,000 or more white protesters waving American flags, Confederate flags, sing Dixie, the song Dixie, and holding up signs, and I'll post the picture later, that say such things as race mixing is communism. Stop the race mixing, march of the Antichrist. And so we see this again, this idea that if you don't like an issue, you just accuse the people of being communists or of being anti-religious. When people recognize her and see that she is one of these girls, they immediately surround her and start jeering at her and screaming at her and cursing at her and threatening her. Elizabeth Eckford, not surprisingly, gets very scared and begins to walk home and the mob follows her, jeering, screaming, and yelling. The thing is, and tell me if this seems familiar to you, <laughs> there were camera crews there, there were journalists there, and so they took photographs and they had film reels. And so we could see a child. Remember, Eckford is only, I think, 15, I said? Yeah, she is a 15-year-old girl being trailed by a mom of, mob of screaming, howling whites, screaming racial slurs at her, threatening to murder her, etc. And she just walks and walks and walks silently, sullenly, solid face. The photographers photograph this. The TV crews capture this. And so by that evening, we all saw what happened. Eventually, Eckford made it to a bus stop. She sat down where uh, one woman, we don't know if she was part of the mob at first or not, but either way, came and sat with her put her arm around her and protected her from this howling mob threatening to murder a child for the crime of being black and wanting to go to Little Rock Central High School. Uh, Eckford reported later on that it was at that moment when that woman had her arm around her and she finally felt a one human being's comfort and kindness that she cried. Daisy Bates is, of course, traumatized and terrified. Bates' plan was for all the children to be escorted in by ministers and, and prominent community leaders who supported them. When the eight remaining children, and I'm going to keep reminding and saying the word children, these are children who are taking among the most courageous steps 
in our nation's history. When the eight children arrive at the high school escorted by local ministers and other prominent, important kind of moral figures, community leaders, both white and black, white ministers volunteer to help escort the children, they find the Arkansas National Guard has barred the doors and the children are denied access by Arkansas National Guardsmen who are fully armed and literally at some points use their weapons to keep children from going to high school. That night, Fabus announces that he had ordered the guard to block the admission of the students to the school. Immediately after that, a lawsuit is filed against Fabus and against the National Guard for uh, <clears throat> blocking. And it would take days for the court to issue an injunction blocking the guard from blocking the kids. Fabus is all over the media. The kids keep trying to go to school. After that point, Eckford safely with the rest of the group. And they keep getting turned away, turned away, turned away, turned away. Finally, on September 20th, the court rules in favor of the plaintiffs. And the ruling is that Fabus illegally called up the guard and illegally used the National Guard to block children from going to school and that it is his obligation to assist them. The next day, the Little Rock Police Department is ordered to sneak the children into the high school. They sneak the children into the school early before the school day starts and hoping to avoid drama. When word gets out that the kids had been snuck into the school, a riot breaks out outside the high school. And the kids are quickly bundled up snuck out the side door into cars and driven home for fear of their lives. After that, Eisenhower, the president who had been kind of waffling on the issue, announces that he's taking action. He calls up the 101st Airborne and other military units of the National Guard, puts them under his direct command, he federalizes them, and he orders them to escort the children into the school on September the 25th. So the children finally enter the school on September the 25th, and each of them had uh, a guard, a guardian, two actually, to protect them from violence. But as one of the, one of the nine recounted later, protecting us from violence is not the same as protecting us. And so what began with denial outside the doors turned into a denial of education inside the doors. The guard escorted the children for weeks and weeks, but eventually, as happens, the news cycle moves on, the camera crews go home, the journalists go home, and Eisenhower ordered the guard to stand down. And it's at this point that what we today will just call bullying, but really is racial hate crimes in this case, begins in earnest. The children are uh, attacked, yelled at, teachers refuse to teach them, they're stuck off in the sides of the room, they'd be isolated, the boys would be attacked in the locker room and gym class and beaten up. For instance, uh, some examples, Melba Patillo, who was one of the older students, was kicked and beaten and then had acid thrown in her face in a science class. Gloria Ray was pushed down a flight of stairs, and all nine children were barred from participating in extracurricular activities, so no sports, no clubs, nothing like that. Eventually, one of the students would snap, um, and it was Minnie Jean, and she was in the cafeteria, and she was had gotten her lunch and was headed to her table, where, of course, all nine would sit together at one table, uh, and some boys were getting in her way and blocking her and not letting her walk past. And so finally she just dumped her lunch on these boys. She was immediately suspended and then expelled. Uh, just to 
I know this is obvious, but it, it warrants saying, despite the fact that the children were beaten up, physically assaulted, had acid thrown in their faces, were screamed at, racial slurs, etc., not a single white student was ever disciplined, suspended, or expelled during the entire school year, but Minnie Jean was. That left eight students. It was an agonizing year. Uh, I believe it was Gloria said that her National Guard escort soldier said to her, you need to be a warrior and you need to just look straight ahead, ignore everything around you, and tune out everything else or you will not survive this. So again, just put in perspective again, we are talking about a child being told that to attend high school they need to behave as a warrior because of the harassment and the violence they are experiencing. They survive the year despite constant harassment, abuse, and bullying, the type of behavior that is beyond the pale. Ernest Green was a senior and he graduates. And of course, at the graduation ceremony, he is seated away from all the other children and they would not even give him his diploma at the ceremony. Uh, however, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did attend the ceremony. So these eight children who survived the year, nine initially, including Eckford, who somehow went back after experiencing her harrowing ordeal that morning, underwent just extraordinary circumstances for a basic right to a basic education. And very often we hear the story ending right there. It didn't end right there because after the school year ended and Ernest Green graduated, those eight remaining, seven, sorry, Minnie Jean had been expelled. The seven remaining students were set to return the following year. And this is where the story takes a turn we often don't hear about. Governor Orville Falbus closed down every high school in Little Rock, Arkansas. And one of the missing stories of this struggle is that this strategy was not unique to him. The Brown vs. Board of Education ruling said where the state has undertaken to provide it. And what that means is if the state undertook not to provide public education, then they did not have to provide it equally. And so Fabus shut down the high schools. There was what they call the lost year where all high schools in Arkansas were shut down until his action was deemed unconstitutional and the high schools were forced back open. In the meantime, these children had to find other ways of being educated. It wasn't safe for them. And in fact, Elizabeth Eckford moved to California where she had a sponsoring family. And the kids did correspondence courses or they moved to other parts of the country because their lives were still in danger for the steps they had taken, even though they were told, <laughs> excuse me, even though they were children. And yeah, I see what you're saying. I assume it's Tiandra about being warriors. It's a huge point, right? that to live your life and do basic human things, you have to behave like a warrior. But this fight was huge. And one of the things when you look at it is we have to remember that this was a fight that the youth had to fight. The children had to do this. They had to lead the way. And the children led us, our society forward, 14, 15, 16, 17 year old kids risked their lives and faced unbelievable harassment 
and violence simply to receive an equal education. And Southern states with their Southern Manifesto were so opposed to this idea of integration that they denounced it as communism, they denounced it as anti-Christ and anti-Christian, and then they actually shut down public education. In southwestern Virginia, there are school systems that were shut down for more than a decade rather than integrate. And children there never had the opportunity to go to school because they would rather not provide school at all than provide equal schooling to black and white children. But the one thing I am going to put up besides thinking about this is that we so often see these children in these grim faces. There's pictures of Elizabeth Eckford everywhere. I'm going to link to a couple Little Rock websites. You can look at photographs and whatnot. But I found one that I've never seen before. And this is so huge and so important. It's why I want to see it. I made sure it's, a, it's an Associated Press photograph. I'm going to credit it because it's that obscure photo. And it's of the nine children in October coming out of school. And they are laughing and they are smiling and they are children. One of the things that we must always be on guard about as we consider stories of black lives in America is that we can't focus exclusively on Elizabeth Eckford, the stoic warrior, being harassed and victimized. They're children and they experience joy. They live lives of joy. And we have to remember that they can have joy despite all circumstances, right? This notion that many, many of you may, may have heard of or read about, this notion of black joy, we have to remember there is still joy. These kids could still be joyous. These kids are kids, were kids, I, sorry, at that time after all. And so I'm gonna put that picture up so you can see children being children because despite the fact that they are these incredible butt kicking, well, not butts, door kicking pioneers who kicked open the doors of Little Rock Central High School, they were children. And we should never underestimate the capacity and the power of children to make a difference. And we should support them in doing so as well, of course, because they couldn't have done it alone. But in the end, Ultimately, despite all the NAACP and legal and lawsuits and Daisy Bates and whatever, in the end, it was children who had to be the first people to step through those doors. Now, one little caveat, we still have a highly segregated school system. And a lot of the reasons why are the strategies that the Southern Manifesto and the Southern schools did. Oh, neighborhood schools, you go to school in a neighborhood or, or whatever. And so we, this is still a real issue in our society uh, that we have to face. But nonetheless, remember that these kids can lead the way behind us. We've got to stand behind them and stand with them when they talk about this better world and when they try to kick open those doors to a better future. So anybody have any immediate questions? I'm kind of running a bit long here. Sorry, the story means a lot to me. <laughs> I'll give you a minute to think of any questions. So I get that picture up in the meantime. I'm gonna post the picture on the event site. That I'm talking about of the kids being just kids. because I love it. And then I'll post links to follow up. Uh, if not, you can post questions in the comment section and I'll try to answer them. I'll be providing links of information. Uh, the National Park Service has a website. The University of Arkansas also has developed several online resource spaces for incidents in American history, excuse me, incidents in Arkansas history, including uh, some very, very unpleasant, horrific circumstances 
like a, a, a horrible racial massacre that occurred in Arkansas? Yes, good question, Lynn. Thank you. All of them eventually acquired the diplomas. However, only the youngest, Gloria, got it from Little Rock High School because she was a freshman and she said she was stubborn and she was determined and she wasn't gonna let Fabus win. And so she took correspondence courses and she actually graduated from Little Rock in 1960. Um, so yeah, the rest of them, correspondence courses, moving elsewhere. Um, the psychologist, Kenneth Clark, whose work had helped influence Brown versus Board of Education, took one of the kids in. Ernest Green actually had his entire college education paid for by an anonymous benefactor who promised to do so if he would tough out the whole year, and he did. Any other questions? All right, this has been a little bit long, so I'm gonna end it here. If you think of anything, you know, put it in the comments. I'll try to post it. I'm gonna put this picture up of children being children, the way that I prefer to remember them, these nine kids just being nine happy kids at school, which all children should have the opportunity to be just happy kids in school. They shouldn't have to be, quote, warriors for justice. All right? All the best, everyone. Thank you for coming along and, you know, adopt animals. <laughs> Until next week. Bye.